We have people joining us late at this time. We've got a, a long nice. list of presenters this evening, so we need to get started. Uh, I want to welcome you. My name is Gary Johnson. I'm a member of the Men's Fellowship here at the Unitarian Universalist Society of Fair Haven. And uh, we are a informal group of men here at the church that occasionally decide to see if we can organize something. This is one of the first times we've or organized something in the evening, so this is an attempt at something new. Uh, I want to welcome you to this facility. If, if any of you haven't been here before, this was built in 1904. Uh, from plans that were filed in 1901, so all of this construction was done in three years, wow. and it is unbelievable. So if you've never been in the sanctuary, you need to come back sometime on a Sunday or sometime when the sanctuary is open and see what it looks like. Um, just for some uh, items that we need to discuss, uh, there are three exits uh, available for fire exits, there's one out the hallway and to the right. There's the door that probably came in, out the hallway to the left. And then up this way, there's a back door that also uh, provides an exit. Uh, there are restrooms um, down out of the hallway. There's a men's room first, almost right across the hall, and then women's room downstairs uh, to the left. Uh, and, oh yeah, there's handicap exit. Oh, there's handicap, yeah, the rest from around the corner. They around the corner. And the and there's some water. If you would like a bottle of water, there's some water free back in the corner. Uh, in case you you get thirsty during this uh, long presentation. Um, so I, I think we're prepared to get started. I, I'll first introduce uh, Reverend Jordan Nelson Long, the minister of, the, of our church here. Thank you and welcome. that I said yes to giving the opening invocation this evening because to be truly human is to be rooted deeply in a context. A church, therefore, must deeply know and welcome the surrounding community, and we want to be one of those entities here that you know that you will find the doors open and learning and discussion inside. We want to know the community and we want to be concerned with the concerns of the people. This has always been the work of the church. But it is not the only work of the church. To be truly human is to be rooted in context, and to be truly a church is to ask always how we can help others to be more truly connected with their humanity. And so if you will forgive a moment of prophetic witness in this current social political context in which we find ourselves, a church is here to ask not only how things are and how we can serve a community, but to ask unflinchingly how things might yet be. To insist on a vision of what yet could be. And thus I leave you, those of you who have worked tirelessly to make the bikeway a reality both originally in Fairhaven and now in its expansion, I leave you with my thanks. And I leave you also with a charge, all of us, if you choose to accept it, fellow humans. In this project and in all of its connective potential, I ask that our eyes be drawn not only eastward to the communities of Marion, Mattapoisett, and Rochester, but westward also, always, 
I cannot stay with you this evening because I am part of a small group working committedly to say that immigration saves lives and that New Bedford needs our help. And so I ask you to remember that community also saves lives and that as we continue to go forward and fund this project, that we let our connections include New Bedford and its people, including tangibly with what people need to bike and to walk safely among our communities. We are part of a wider community, part of a wider human family. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Um, I think I was asked to host this this evening just because I'm the only person that I've ever seen on Sunday morning riding over the bike path in a sport coat and tie. So, <laughs> uh, I'm the lone, uh, yeah, dressed up cyclist. So if you see me, say hi. Um, our first, our first presentation is actually from Craig Delapena. He started uh, in the railroad industry, amazingly enough, back in the 90s, and then decided that a lot of those railroad beds would look better as bicycle paths and walking trails. So um, he, he's joined us from Western Massachusetts, where he uh, now, and among many other things, has the Northeast, Northeast Greenway Solutions consulting firm. So we're looking forward to a great presentation on what can be done with, with changing uh, railroad beds into bike trails and how that's relevant to us on the South Coast. So I'll turn it over to Craig. Thank you. Should I be holding this one? Yeah, that's, that that's one? just for the camera. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. I've been coming here several times now over the last 20 years, actually. This is the 20th anniversary of the opening of the Phoenix Bike Trail, the rail trail in Fairhaven here. I was at the ribbon cutting, and I couldn't believe it, but Mass Highway, it was, as it was zoned back then, they did not show up. And that was the last time Mass Highway or Mass DOT ever never showed up at a ribbon cutting. Now they live for ribbon, ribbon cuttings. <laughs> Believe me, I've been doing this so long, and, and as Mark mentioned, I used to market rail freight. I operated uh, the most profitable railroad transloading facility in New England. I would market rail freight by identifying commodities coming across the continent on trucks that would be best served to be put onto the railroad. And our company it was one of the original short line railroad operators in the United States dating from the 1930s. And wherever they had a railroad set up, they had a small entity called Railroad Distribution Services set up to help generate traffic. And so I operated the RDSs in Western New England for Pinsley Railroad Company. And in fact, uh, I was invited to write a series of books by one of my customers. We used to handle an inbound move where we take obsolete topo maps and convert them into stationary geolopes. You've seen them in stores, geolopes, topolopes. That came to our facility, and he was in my office one day. It was actually almost 25 years ago, uh, February, uh, February of 1994. And he picked up a book on my desk called The Lost Railroads of New England. I have a background in railroad history and I know how to make a railroad work. So it was like a natural for someone to say to me, that's this map business is a little sideline for me. What I do is actually, I publish outdoor recreational titles and guidebooks. And if you were to write a manuscript on one in New England with a strong bent towards the history of these lines, because they're not cute paths in the woods. They're very important corridors on how our New England cities came to be prosperous. And I, so we, he contracted with me to write a book about New England rail trails. My wife and I went out and bought bikes and biked every mile of every open rail trail back in the summer of 1994. The book came out in 95. It was a hit. There was actually a guy buying the books by the case and giving them away at trailheads and telling people 
in his words that these weren't just cute paths in the woods. These are important historic corridors that connected our communities. And so of course I had to track that guy down and we found him and he was actually a major donor to Rails to Trails Conservancy. And he got me a job interview with David Burwell at his mother's house on Fay Road in Woods Hole. One of the earliest built rail trails in New England is there, the Shining Sea Trail. And I was lucky enough to have a five hour job interview overlooking Vineyard Sound. They hired me immediately. And I became a lobbyist for them, covering all the New England states. And in the background everywhere, I'm a burrower. I get into things that you can't imagine. And I parachuted into all the wars. And I was involved here on the South Coast in Mattapoise years ago. And I've been involved in wars you've never heard of and all the ones you have heard of, at least in the background. I would never go to places where there was no angst. And I would go to the wars. I'm battle hardened. And in fact, uh, I worked for Rails to Trails Conservancy for six-ish years. Um, when I left them, when, the, when they left me actually, when they moved the office out of New England, what to do next? I guess that means I'm gonna have to become a realtor, specializing in the sale of houses near rail trails. Because those antis have all told me over the years they would never be able to sell their house if the trail got built. So that's what I did. I'm the first realtor in the United States in that realm. I'm very successful. I'm the top realtor at my firm. And my marketplace is Northampton, Massachusetts, where I live actually eight feet from the oldest municipally built trail off of Cape Cod in New England. And I know exactly what it's like to live near a trail. So I've been doing these presentations. I got like 50 or 60 in the can, let's say. I've given over 1,200 lectures like this in 21 states. And they're all a little different. So if you've seen it before, this is a little different. Um, I try to make them a little different each time so nobody gets bored. But uh, what you're looking at here is actually the, uh, bef the before pictures above and that shows the, uh, the DCR, State Parks Agency, owned land in Watertown along the Charles River. About 12 years ago, maybe more, they sent in a guy by the name of Dan Driscoll. He was very famous internally on DCR staff, still works there, as a guy who was very gentle when talking with adjoining landowners, even the ones who actually oozed over onto state-owned, publicly-owned land along the Charles River. And he gently rolled them back. So you see a before and after sign here. Why it's important here, these are the densest network being developed in North America is within 125 miles of my house. These aren't obscure, uh, forgotten coal mine branch lines where no one lives. What we are building out here, and I'll show you maps of this, is the densest network in North America. It is the most worthwhile network in North America here. And that's why it's important. What I'm gonna touch on some themes here. I'm gonna give you a reading list for transportation advocates because bikes are transportation. And there's some really cool books out there now. Uh, the Politics of Addition by Borging People. I'm a trained lobbyist and we borg people. We get them to do our bidding without them knowing it. And reassembling former railroad corridor the hard way. That's what I love to do. I love to buy dead railroad corridor and make it into a trail. And I'm converting rectangular, rectangular thinking land trust, a traditional land trust, or rectangular thinking. But the 21st century land trusts are actually linear thinking. And I train land trusts how to do that. In fact, one of my projects is in eastern New York, the Columbia Greenway, Columbia, uh, Columbia Conservancy, Land Conservancy, you know, just over from the Berkshires in New York. Uh, they are building linear parks there. And dealing with people opposed to the trails, that's what I really love too. This is, uh, they really just want to have someone listen to them. It's true. So here we go, reading, reading list for advocates, transportation advocates. And actually, I have Northeast Greenway Solutions, yes. 
Uh, we also operate a bed and breakfast in Northampton. And actually, in, it's the Florence Village of Northampton. And that is where it's the most completely intact Civil War era industrial village in New England. And I'll probably talk a little bit about that. Central Highlands Conservancy is my land acquisition vehicle where I swoop in and buy corridor, block out sales to adjoining landowners. And I am a realtor at the Murphys. I'm an associate broker at the Murphys Realtors, and I'm lucky enough to have my office five doors from my house. So now I have the shortest commute I can ever imagine. In fact, I used to drive 900 miles a week when I used to work for Rails to Trails because this is the densest network being built in North America, and it was a target-rich environment. I went everywhere, everywhere. In fact, about six weeks ago, I just resurrected the last place that actually voted down a trail in Massachusetts. There were eight or ten of them, I forget right now. But the last one I haven't circled back to was Belchertown. Belchertown voted it down, I believe, the same time Weston voted it down. Weston is now finished, completed. They haven't had the ribbon cutting because they just finished the construction this winter. But the reading list here, this is interesting. Outside Lies Magic, a book by John Stilgo, teaches you how to read your community by the seat of a bicycle, which is different from the seat of a car. Getting There, the epic struggle of road versus rail in the American century. And uh, why do we have less than best passenger railroad system in the United States now. It's, this tells it all, what happened, what happened to the trolleys, you should read this book. Divided Highways, when this was made into a documentary on PBS in 1999, um, the guy who did that documentary, he's a partner with Ken Burns. Ken Burns and Larry Hott have a company called Florentine Films based in Florence, Massachusetts. Larry Hott has a big giant Emmy sitting on his desk from this, winning an Emmy. And uh, it's all about the change in the United States since the build out of the interstate highway system, for the good and for the bad. But nonetheless, <coughs> Larry Hott is one of my battle-hardened veterans in one of the most egregious rail trail wars in the Northeast. For economics, this is a book about breaking conventional wisdom. And I'll probably break your conventional wisdom here tonight and when it smashes and hits the floor, it won't leave a stain on this beautiful floor here. But this is uh, an interesting book to read as well. Peddling Revolution by Jeff Mapes from the Portland, Oregonian newspaper. Why are all the cities in the United States starting to become more bike friendly? What's going on around here? There's a theme here, and this book will illustrate that all. The Tipping Point, how you don't need a big army to make change. When I go in to build a friends group, and I've done this over 50 times in the Northeast, you don't need a big group. You just need a small group committed who know how to borg other organizations, and I'll tell you more about that. And the newest in my book of favorites is Street Fight by Janak Sadik Khan, who is the Department of Transportation head in New York City in the Bloomberg administration. And you don't have to take notes on this because I'm going to tell you how to find all these books here in a moment. But if Frank Sinatra said, if you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. And I would say that if you can have bikes come to New York, you can have it done anywhere. This book tells how it was all done. Short little vignettes of all the to-dos about how she overcome opposition, overcame opposition. And this, The Shadows of the Past Everywhere, especially here in New England. This is a book came out in 95 when I was doing the research for my New Jersey book. This is great. It's all in my genre of rusting railroad infrastructure. All the, I love this stuff. In fact, I owned three railroad bridges at one time. But this, I come to the end of the trail doing this. This was in uh, Hunterdon County, New, uh, New Jersey the Columbia Rail Trail, named after Columbia Gas, believe it or not, because they built the trail. This was not far from governor, former Governor Christy Whitman's house. And I come to the end, I turn around, I see this scene on the left, and I, I, I realize that this is actually that. That's a Google map today. 
But things haven't changed all that much. The railroad is still there without its rails, it's still a trail. But it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Um, one of the things I do also, if you're interested, I do an e-newsletter. I've hired staff to help curate this. And it goes out to over 10,000 people every month. And it's all it is is newspaper stories that you never saw about this stuff happening everywhere. And uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things going on in the state government now in Massachusetts that you have no idea. But if you run a Google search about these topics every day, you will see all the newspaper stories. To get it, you can email me, Craig, at theborg.net, the-borg.net, and uh, I'd be happy to add you to that list. It's free, not obtrusive, once a month. Don't spam you, don't sell emails. Um, just let me know if you want to get it. The, uh, also, if you want to get the reading list, I'll be happy to send that to you. The Politics of Addition by Borging Untraditional Allies. This is about convincing others what you want to do. This is from the old Star Trek The Next Generation, how if those, those Borg-like characters, if they touched you, you became half humanoid like them then you did their bidding. So I Borg untraditional allies. Here, this is the longest pedestrian bridge in the world. It's over the Hudson River at, at Poughkeepsie. Saw its last train in 1970, early 70s, 74, it had a fire that actually uh, uh, burned 700 feet of the bridge, weakened the structure, so they took it out of service. And never could see a train again, and, and it didn't. And then it was actually bought by this, uh, up, subsequently, ultimately, by the state, who then built this pathway. The people who helped advocate for this were realtors. I trained the Ulster County and Dutchess County Realtor Association to go in and learn about this stuff, how to, why these are important, especially, we call these gateway cities in Massachusetts, this term for old industrial places where immigrants first came in and worked in the mills. Same thing in Poughkeepsie, but they don't call it a gateway city. But nonetheless, it was actually more people walked or biked across this bridge in the first year than rode trains on it in almost 100 years it operated. It's, uh, it's leading the transformation of Poughkeepsie, New York. This thing that was on its skyline, 212 feet above the river, sat there for a generation, rusting away, until the realtors put it over the top. The realtor association in that area helped create the advocacy to do this. In fact, in Kingston, New York, another sort of gateway city on the Hudson River, they are now building the trail up into the Catskills, past one of New York City's reservoirs that will be under construction this year. The realtors sealed the deal and made it happen. Rail trails in the Northeast, there's over 250 projects within 125 miles of my house. This is the densest network in the United States. Nothing else is like it because the railroads were overbuilt by a factor of three, and I'll show you. These projects go right where people live, work, and play. When I said borging on traditional allies, this was Mass Highway just before they became Mass DOT. They were actually the last DOT in the United States to have their name Highway in their name and became DOT. All these people have now retired, but Louisa Piwanski here became the commissioner and she helped transform Mass DOT into a leader in this stuff, what's going on. And these were not traditional friends, but they, they became enamored by it because these are the only ribbon cuttings they can come to where there'll be hundreds of people showing up on a work day to give them kudos for doing these jobs. Other non-traditional allies, rail fans, rail fans, are important to include in these projects. Local civic organizations like the Rotary Clubs, the Rotarian Magazine, this was actually dated back to May of 2000, but this helped, this article, which I helped do the research on, this article 
actually helped inspire about 50 other Rotary Clubs to become leaders. The Rotarians, the Kiwanis, those are all civic organizations in your community that help steer and launch the debate about the topic du jour, the topic of the day. And they all became involved. Uh, Yankee Magazine used to call me for a quarterly story about rail trail development in New England. They've now uh, do it on their own, and but these are this is when this when they first started calling me, they used to be sort of a, a traditional tourist magazine, just kind of drive into town, see what's going on, and but now they encourage you to actually get out of your car and go for a walk or go for a bike ride. Like the Garden Club here in southwestern Vermont, where the Rutland Railroad's corkscrew division came out of Bennington to get to Chatham, New York, and it was so curvy they called it the corkscrew division because the milk train, that was their first milk train, and it went down to the New York City market. But the Bird Club, excuse me, the Garden Club here is helping build the rail trail. Another example of birding clubs in western New York where the Roger Torrey Peterson estate is in just outside of Buffalo. A lot of birders are out there. The birders are helping build the rail trails. They don't call it a bike path. It's, from their context, it's birds. Tourism-based organizations. I live in Hampshire County. I'm on the, we operate a bed and breakfast, therefore I borg my way in to tourism agencies. Hampshire County's claim to fame is the only county in Massachusetts does not touch, that does not touch the ocean or another state. It is that other side of Massachusetts. And there are about, I don't know, 16, 14 uh, agents, I think there are 16 agencies around the state. And there is now a big push inside the governor's office. He's created a trails team and he's put MOT mass office of travel and tourism onto it so they can learn because this is big. This is not chunk change. The one big trail in New York, the Erie Canal Trail from Buffalo to Albany, produces $250 million a year and it's not even fully built. It was so big that when this report, it's actually three or four years old now, when this came out and Governor Cuomo saw it, he said, we're going to build another 400 miles. We're going to go from New York City to Albany to connect to this. We're going to Canada. And everything along the way where there's a dead railroad, we're going to build that out as a feeder. So there's another 400 miles under development that he insists that will be done before he retires as a governor. That's what's going on. Not because it's a cute path, but because it brings real dollars to places that may not be doing as well as they did a generation ago. Here's another little example. Regional business magazines. This guy on the right here, he was the president of what's called the Queen City Rail Trail. It's a trail in downtown Manchester, New Hampshire. The guy on the left developed Star Markets or Shaw's Markets, and he was building a store there in Manchester, and, and, and the guy on the right invited him to connect to the future trail, and he said, oh, we're not just going to connect, we're going to build it. So the first section built, this was 10 years ago, was built by the developer, which helped spur the municipal government to action. Visionary land trusts. I love visionary land trusts who are linear thinking land trusts because it helps connect all their holdings in a given area. These are all linear thinking land trusts. These are land trusts that start off, and they do have some rectangular holdings, let's say, but they also are building out the trail because they have capacity for people that like to do things, so there's sometimes a hands-on element, but sometimes they just get things done. Realtor associations, as I mentioned earlier. As I said, the corridors here go right past where people live, work, and play. And these are pictures of Rhode Island. Uh, the, this one here actually has a picture. Uh, this was in April 1999. It's here in town. I took a picture of that house because that house sold the day of the grand opening. Because someone who lived there before didn't want to have the trail there 
he was a trail opponent here, and uh, it was sold the day of the clo the closing was the day of the grand opening. Right where live people live, work, and play. I said, it makes them hard to get built because it's easy to if this is a newfangled idea, people will always be opposed to them. But these trails, when I said they go right past where people live, work, and play, here just in. Eastern Mass, Southeastern Mass, Cape Cod. These are old companies that used to be rail served just by the New Haven Railroad. This was from the New Haven Railroad's employee magazine touting all these successful companies just in the Metro Boston or Southeast Mass that were on only the New Haven Railroad, not the New York Central, not the uh, Boston and Maine Railroad, just, as, just New Haven Railroad corridor. Here, this is a high watermark of railroad construction in southern New England. This is a map by the New Haven Railroads. So they made their lines bold and the enemy railroads very faint. But nonetheless, this is what has been abandoned since the high watermark. And this is what is pretty, pretty much currently open, though it's a little bit out of date because I don't really have time to update this. Um, this is what the final build out will likely look like. And on Cape Cod, it doesn't show uh, the little extensions that have been built there. There's been some extensions, but there's all over 75 open or projects in Massachusetts alone. Um, but this is what a dead railroad looks like. Trash abounds. Usually the, the tracks are still there. The MBTA, if you didn't know this, there's another little oddity. They are the second largest landowner in Massachusetts. And what do they own? You're looking at what they own dead railroad corridors with the tracks still in place with trash abound. This is what happens when you convert it. Mother walking clubs. This is actually right outside my house here, the one with the little sign that says that was put up in the early 80s because the motorists in Northampton and Florence were so upset that people were walking or biking across the road that the motorists insisted that the city should make them stop, dismount, and walk their bike across. And so later, those, those signs are gone, but it was kind of an oddity. This is uh, everywhere we go, we see mothers walking clubs, or mothers just walking with their kids, everywhere. <coughs> hmm. And when I was hired by Rails to Trails Conservancy, one of the first things I did was, was try to take back the stupid directive that was put out by Mass Highway. Mass Highway was the only state in 50 that said if you were going to use federal dollars to build your rail trail, you had to pave it. That touched off wars in at least 10 places where there were a lot of equestrians who did not like the idea of a trail being paved. And so there were multiple wars. Um, and uh, my job number one for me was to take back that directive. So I went to the state audit, post oversight and audit committee in the state house. And the guy on the right there, his name is Joel Barrera. And he brought out the Office of Disabilities and the Architectural Review Board. And, and they said, this is just fine. This, by the way, is about halfway across the state, state in Central Mass, town of West Boylston on what is becoming the Mass Central Rail Trail, the longest rail trail in Massachusetts but this was in 1999. The Rails to the Trails movement started from a letter uh, in September of 1963 by this woman, Mae Watts, who said, wouldn't it be a great idea, instead of just selling this off to adjoining landowners, this old interurban electrified trolley line, let's save it for our communities. Let's make it a walking or biking trail we can do Lots of great things here. And that finally did take hold and got built. But there were some visionary people here. Barbara Burwell, with her son David, when I met up with him, this was back in the late 90s. They've both since passed away, actually. But um, Barbara Burwell, if you email me, I can send you this book. This book lives online. It tells how the Shining Sea Trail got built. It was a pitched battle. A lot of the, I know this is breaking your conventional wisdom, 
but a lot of the original proponents on this were people who lived right next to that dead railroad, and they wanted to see it become a biking and walking trail. But there were some people opposed. One guy actually was able to buy a piece and he refused to be pried away. And so the, the community had to go through eminent domain to pry that person away. And he fought it all the way to the SJC in Massachusetts. This is actually the first time in uh, the history of the United States that a Supreme Court and a state actually green-lighted the idea of using eminent domain to reclaim dead railroad for a trail. Nowhere else was this done before. Massachusetts, as you're probably aware, is lots of firsts, and, uh, and this was a first. But in any case, the state was upset that they didn't have any role in this whatsoever. It was from the railroad and to the town and that landowner. The state had no role. And so they passed two laws, 161C, which gave the state a right of first refusal, and 40, it's actually backwards, it's 40 slash 54A, which actually uh, governs construction next to a former railroad. Those laws are still in place, and they're still useful to this day, giving uh, a little public hearing aspect before a corridor gets sold or developed. And, and I use that on occasion to make sure nothing bad happens. Um, in the last 25 years, only one time did I ever see a governor show up at a ribbon cutting, that was on Cape Cod actually, with uh, former Governor Jane Swift, who after um, Paul Salucci went off to something else, she became the governor for a while. But the governor now, Governor Charlie Baker, he loves this stuff. And the fact that he's been reelected, he will be coming out of the closet. He loves this stuff. And we see this all the time. In fact, it was very hard to develop trails in Massachusetts, but now we're seeing it accelerate. In fact, there's a uh, governor's trails team internally in the state house that yeah. brings together every two weeks uh, people across the spectrum from different agencies to, 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 what, to figure out what they're all doing, to take down the silos between agencies, and it has done a miraculous thing. Um, Governor, Lieutenant Governor Polito is a lot of times at these things. These are getting built out. This took 13 years to build this tunnel underneath the active railroad in Northampton. So much so that we held Mass Central Rail Trail Coalition this past summer. We held, I think it was our sixth Golden Spike event. And we had uh, plaques for Governor Baker and Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Polito and the keynote speaker was, uh, was Kurt Gartner, who's in charge of land policy at the Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. And so he came out and gave a great overview of what's going on around the state. It was the largest rail trail event held this year in Massachusetts. But this is, uh, they invited me to the State House to go and give them their special plaques. And now, here's an interesting thing. This is the trails team inside the State House. But this guy, Joel Barrera, you can see him before in 1999, and his new job was the Director of Strategic Planning for Governor Baker. And Joel Barrera loves rail trails, and so I'm sure that's why Charlie Baker loves rail trails now. But uh, Joel, 20 years in, still smiling, but he, uh, he actually works in a different part of the state government now, but he was he was heavily involved in getting the governor to be more interested in this. But who would be interested in a place with active transportation? And that's what it's all about. Millennials, the largest group buying property in the United States are the millennials. Any realtors here? I meant to ask that some realtors come because uh, it would be beneficial for them to be here tonight. But, the, uh, the millennials, do you ever hear of the third place? Did you ever read a book called The Third Place? The first place is your family, and that's your most important place. The second place is your workplace, and you know a lot of people there, but you don't usually see them outside of work. But the third place used to be like the Elks Club, perhaps, or 
sort of the third place where you didn't see people outside the first place. But today, a lot of places, the third place is the rail trail in a community. You see people that you don't see in the other first two places, and millennials want this. If they see that there's a war going on about the, about the potential for a rail trail, they're not coming. They want it open and functioning. The, uh, this magazine cover is from the National Association of Realtors. They actually have a smart growth magazine. I don't want to say that and have you all fall off your chairs because you've probably never heard the word realtor and smart growth in the same sentence. But there, nonetheless, that's what's going on. Uh, reassembling former railroad corridor the hard way. That's what I do with Central Highlands Conservancy. I work for a company called the Murphy's Realtors and David Murphy's on the board of directors of MLS. MLS is the transmitter of information to all the realtors. And so I do things that <coughs> makes it easier to build rail trails by making trail development more default and normal. And, uh, and I've set up a specialized search using their new tools where I can draw uh, an oblong circle along a dead railroad corridor and see if there's anything for sale, any land for sale next to it, all over the state. And as I said, I've hired an assistant who loves to do this. And we find places that are on the market and we go in and make sure everybody knows about the 40 slash 54A projects to get a public hearing. Or if there's uh, an opportunity for me to buy corridor, I'll do that. Um, I sell corridor for my cost plus expenses to a local land trust. I've uh, bought 3.2 miles on the Mass Central Rail Trail, which is from Boston to Northampton. That east-west red line that is the southernmost line, we're going by the big reservoir here in Clinton. This is that line going all the way to Northampton. But it's uh, this section right here, just sort of like west of Amherst, uh, excuse me, east of Amherst, east of Ware, but west of Worcester, this little forgotten piece here. I heard that this was gonna become available for sale, so I swooped in and bought it. Didn't cost me anything because the land trust out there was gonna backstop me and buy me out in two years. And so the local lender there, we don't go to you know, big national banks, it's local <coughs> lenders, and they lent me the money. I then went and met my new neighbors who were all frothing at the mouth angry that they couldn't buy it. But I bought it, and it is a trail now. In fact, not only did I buy the dead railroad, but I bought three bridges there that would have been scrapped out. The longest one was 130 feet long. This is a like the approach to a bridge, this is all uh, bent timbers, they call them, or timber bents. Um, but this is the last pony truss bridge still standing in New England that I saved from being scrapped out. And the land trust has now just finished, about two years ago, not only finishing the trail with stone dust, but also uh, refurbishing the bridges. And last year, I went with my lovely bride, Last year was like minus 10 degrees and our little Scotty. And, uh, but this year there was a bunch of people that came with us and this is one of my bridges. And you were mentioning Bruce at, at dinner tonight about snowmobiles on trails and how they buck, bust up bridges. Well, the snowmobile group here has put the like plastic or rubberized mats here to protect the bridge decking. But this is the East Quabbin Land Trust, a linear thinking land trust. And why am I at the Murphys? Well here, this is the MLS in Massachusetts. I don't know if you've ever seen the back end of this. But this here, there is now a button we can check off near a bike path. That took four years to get that on there. So we've institutionalized the idea because we will never put anything about a house that's bad, the, bolt, the roof is gonna fail, the boiler's about to blow. No, we do only good things. And here, we have a bike path. As I said, it took four years, but I'm patient. And I mentioned that I, uh, I buy railroad corridor to 
And I don't do it quietly. Lots of times I'll do high profile press releases to make state agencies look bad. How can they let this be sold off, erased, melted away? But there's a tunnel out here, and this is a little bit dated this morning. It says, do you want to buy a tunnel? Because the town is just negotiating with the railroad who owns this and another mile and a half of dead railroad in Clinton, Massachusetts. And actually, um, this will be part of the trail, longest tunnel in New England from a dead railroad. There's a live railroad that has a longer one, but this is pretty notable. Um, dealing with people opposed to these things, that's my specialized thing, I love it. Overcoming angst, we're gonna take a walk on Anti Street here. I call them trail neighbors, don't call them abutters. Abutters rhymes with gutters, that's not good. Trail neighbors is better. These are all the reasons they said to me that they couldn't or shouldn't build the trail. Uh, all these things would be bad in their neighborhood. People would break in, steal things, and trash. Well, this is a trash on a dead railroad. All the dead railroads have trash, but they get cleaned up when they become a place that's going to become a real trail and volunteers will go out and help clean them up. This happens everywhere, everywhere. There won't be anyone to take care of it, I've heard. Well, this woman got sick of asking for the county in New York to ask for the leaves to get taken care of on the trail. So she went out, got her own gas-powered leaf blower and she was uh, doing that for a while, but most of the time she just used a broom. But what's unique about her, she was 70 years old and she did it on rubber blades. We see groups like this uh, taking the, the action themselves. This is in uh, Marlboro, Massachusetts, or actually Hudson, Mass, right at the intersection of the East-West Mass Central Rail Trail and the newly built out Assabet River Rail Trail. Uh, this was early efforts to sort of clean up things. In New Hampshire, they, uh, they, they, they pulled out all the ties on a dead railroad between Concord and White River Junction, Vermont. That was like 60 miles. There was 160,000 ties. They did it, and now they have like 25 miles open as a formalized trail. You can do this. All the bridges were redecked by volunteers. When the trail got built here, he put a bridge in to get across the low ditch line there to get to his trail from his backyard. This is. This is happening everywhere. People want to connect to it. If you put that trail in, they'll break in and steal my TV, I've heard over the years. And if you see someone on a trail with a trailer, <laughs> but no kid in the trailer, then it's probably something bad going on. But you can't put a trail near houses, I was told many times, depressed properties would happen. But each house here actually sold in multiple offers. And I know the one on the left pretty good because that was my house. And uh, we bought it a couple of years after that. But here's Fairhaven, the day of the trail opening, of the left photo. The other one is during the summer. But this is actually interesting. This is uh, the, a scene that probably in the 1840s when the trail first, when the railroad first opened. Maybe it was a little later. But this house still sits here today. And people moved there specifically because it was next to the trail. But we see this all over New England. All these houses are always, uh, always touted. In fact, I've been in, involved in over 20 multiple offer situations this year as a realtor. And a lot of those were houses near rail trails. If you are interested in all the reports or white paper studies done on the effects of a rail trail on adjoining property. There is the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail, brucefreemanrailtrail.org. Click on studies or reports and you'll see them all there, brucefreemanrailtrail.org. There's still a few wars involved. I'm involved in three wars today in Dedham, Swampscott, and Linfield. But here's the house we ended up buying uh, after we clear cut the forest there to see what we bought. But we had actually uh, contractors there for 14 months we opened up as a bed and breakfast. The house was featured on Home and Garden Television, actually, and that lives on the website for the bed and breakfast, a little five minute video, if you like. But it's, uh, it's our fun place to live, and we, uh, 
wouldn't live anywhere else. Yankee Magazine featured in Best of New England. And it happens to be at the junction of the longest rail trail in New, in New England, the East-West Trail. But here's Bruce at the intersection of the, the, uh, inter the first interstate trail in, Mass in New England that's actually at the border between Southwick, Mass, and Summers, Connecticut? Suffield, Suffield Connecticut. But it's, uh, that was a few years ago. Thank you, Bruce. But here we are, we're at the end, and I'd like to take questions at the end. I'll stick around so you guys can drill me with questions if you have any. Who's up next? Traffic in Boston is a lot worse than it was in the early 90s and late 80s. Um, so, uh, but, I, but I'm an urban rider, and I'm a rural rider, and I'm also a century rider. <laughs> I haven't done a century in a long time. Um, and I apologize, I don't have a single graphic here for you except the Tour de Creme. Um, apparently I misplaced my flash drive. Um, so I'm just gonna wing it and tell you what's going on. Um, on the uh, Mattapoisett Rail Trail. I am super, super, super excited to tell everybody that the bids came in yesterday. The Mattapoisett... <laughs> the Mattapoisett Rail Trail project is on budget. Uh, we are expecting, um, we understand from our engineers, CLE Foth engineers from Marion, um, that the um, Mattapoisett Rail Trail project is um, going to be probably under contract in early March. And um, at that point, we will learn exactly how long it's going to take to um, build it. And actually, I see in the audience somebody who worked long and hard on this project. Um, Jeff, how long have we been designing the uh, Mattapoisett Rail Trail Phase 1B? Oh, <laughs> okay, well it's been actually since about 2009. Um, it was a long, complicated, environmentally complex project and we are thrilled. For those of you who are familiar um, with, our, um, uh, with the, the area, the existing bike path goes from the center of Fairhaven out towards Mattapoisett and it stops at Mattapoisett Neck Road. The, segment that's going to be built um, starts at Mattapoisett Neck Road, goes across the Mattapoisett River estuary, 
goes in and around the YMCA over to a barrier beach right at the front of Mattapoisett um, Harbor and it um, then goes along the old railroad bed to Depot Street. So there will now be a continuous path from Mattapoisett Center into Fairhaven. And being very mindful of um, what the, um, is it Reverend Jordan? Um, what she uh, told us um, earlier today. We can also ride from Mattapoisett to Fairhaven to New Bedford uh, because it's just a short ride down Middle Street, a low traffic road across the bridge, new infrastructure on the Route 6 bridge to take us into New Bedford, down uh, bike paths, uh, bike lanes, all the way to the magnificent um, bikeway on uh, um, the um, Hurricane Dikes uh, down to the uh, Fort, um, Fort Rodham, <coughs> Fort Tabor. Um, just amazing bike ride. And so with all of that being said, yes, there's more. <laughs> um, what Mattapoisett is planning at this point, um, in part thanks to East Coast Greenway, who alerted us to a grant last summer. Uh, we saw that with Marion coming soon, supposedly 2021 is the schedule for construction from Marion's Washburn Park to the Mattapoisett line. We saw that there's an opportunity to pave a small half mile segment of um, rail trail, which is currently a dirt road, a service road. It's used by service trucks to get out to cell phone towers that we can all see from Route 195. Um, we saw an opportunity to bring people together to get that half mile built um, at the same time that Marion's <coughs> pathway is built. We uh, started because of East Coast Greenway to write a grant to the federal uh, DOT to get not only that done, but a shared use path alongside Industrial Drive and a safe crossing of North Street. What the whole thing would do um, in a very short time using low traffic roads from Main Street in Wareham Main Street, Fearing Hill Road, short piece on County Road, a short piece on Point Road, get on the Marion Rail Trail, uh, follow that across Front Street, get on the, all the way to the town line, get on our half mile extension, um, go down Industrial Drive, get to North Street, a short low traffic connection to Main Street and Depot Street, we can go from Wareham to New Bedford, 20 miles of low traffic, no traffic road along the route of the East Coast Greenway, um, connecting Providence to Provincetown, connecting Key West to um, Calais, Maine. Uh, so we are super excited that uh, with, with each little segment, we're building something really, really, really long. Um, and that said, um, we are shortly launching a fundraiser. We already have a generous donor who is going to match any donations that come in between now and May to help us do what we need to do, um, uh, asking for, for grant money from the state of Massachusetts, asking for the town to support us, but we'd love to see some private support um, to keep us going. and. Um, because we are really, really excited to be creating a regional trail, um, each town being part of that. So, um, uh, no further ado, this is a long program after me. Um, and I want to thank everybody who's been here to um, support each and every community that supports the rail trail. He is the current president of the South Coast Bikeway Alliance. 
which was only incorporated in 2014, but as you heard what I was talking about, extending this, this rail system across the south coast, that really is, is their objective. That's their mission for existing, is connecting all of these communities. So, um, and I know Bob does, how many miles did you put in last year? <laughs> Unknown? <laughs> He's an ardent cyclist, so, uh, oh, and I, I should put in a pitch. If you haven't, if you like to bike, and even if you don't bike that much, sign up for the National Bike Challenge. And you get to record your miles and see how you compare. And these various communities are challenging each other for ridership. But, um, and so Fairhaven's won a couple years, and that place won a couple years. So I encourage you to sign up. So if you're ready, turn it over. Okay, so you just push the down button. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Craig and uh, Bonnie. And um, actually, no one said it so far, but Bonnie is the Matt Poison was the Matt Poison Woman of the Year, recognized for her efforts. <laughs> uh, now, I want to uh, thank the uh, Universal. Uh, the Unitarian Universalist men's group here for inviting us to co-sponsor this event and thank you all for coming out. It's a great turnout. Um, you know, what uh, better thing to do on a, you know, kind of cold, broad uh, winter day than come think about uh, bicycling and all the fun we have in the uh, spring and summer and fall. Um, so just, um, you've heard a little bit, um, you know, from Bonnie about some of the things uh, that have been going on in our, in our region. Um, we are a nonprofit, South Coast Bikeway Alliance. Um, we uh, like to unite all the various uh, entities and uh, bicycling advocates, uh, community uh, organizations um, in our area and try to work together to promote uh, additional funding and infrastructure for cycling. SERPED, the Southeastern Regional Planning and Economic Development <coughs> District, um, supports us in our efforts. So they, have, they have from the start, they helped form the group. Uh, we have here tonight with us uh, Jackie Jones as our representative for SERPED. If you could just raise your hand, Jackie. There she is over there. Um, and I don't know if we have anyone else here from SERPED tonight. No, no. Um, <clears throat> and just for uh, people who are not familiar with our organization, um, Bonnie, Bonnie's with the group, but all the rest of the South Coast Bikeway Alliance members, if you just raise your hand here. Oh, we have Gail Hartnett Rodericks in the back, she's from Westport. Uh, we have Sandy Medeiros in, in, the, in the back from Dartmouth. She's one does all our uh, public relations. You would have uh, probably found out about this event through her. And uh, we have Keith um, McDonald. He's from Westport. Paul Pulowski, he's from New Bedford. And we have, we already heard about Jeff Oaks. He's uh, from Marion and Bonnie um, uh, from uh, Mattapoiset. Myself, I'm from Fairhaven. Uh, so we, uh, and we have a few few others that are not here tonight. Um, so why, why we feel uh, you know these the building this infrastructure is important. You heard a lot from uh, Craig tonight about uh, the the economy and, and the value that it provides to our area. So that's certainly something we're concerned with. Of course, is an environmental uh, impact. I mean, we see people um, you know out of their cars and on their bicycles, literally on this bike path path in Fairhaven. You'll see people walking down the path with small small bags of groceries uh, on their bicycles with groceries, going choosing to do those types of things. So that's certainly environmental impact. You know, transportation getting people uh, off the roadways, uh, even in smaller communities like this versus the cities, is important. Uh, and health uh, certainly um, very important. And in just in the last week's uh, South Coast Today newspaper, there was an article that that talked about. Since the turn of the century, just 19 years ago, the average male has uh, increased their uh, body weight by about nine pounds and the average female by about seven pounds. So certainly that's going in the wrong direction. Uh, and we believe um, you know, th these kind of trails uh, certainly uh, would help us get in, in the right direction. So uh, in recent years, last uh, uh, several years, there have been some very significant developments. Uh, these are some uh, pictures of, of those developments you see in the upper left, the Harbor Walk in Bedford, um, which uh, Mayor Mitchell is a, is a very strong advocate for cycling in our area and secured federal funds for that. If, if, you haven't, if you're from the area and you haven't been on that, 
Uh, I highly recommend it. It's beautiful. Uh, it's the longest elevated stretch of bikeway in the uh, country. And there's since, um, there's now one on uh, uh, the Cove Walk, which is on the other side of Hurricane Barrier. Um, also the uh, Alfred J. Lima, uh, similar to Bonnie, has been a huge long-term long, uh, advocate for cycling um, and was, uh, you know, one of the, the principals involved with this named after him, the Kikishan River Rail Trail in Fall River. Again, if you haven't seen that, um, it's, it's a beautiful uh, stretch of, uh, you know, relatively short, but beautiful stretch of, of uh, infrastructure. Very costly to build because of, you see the bridges like this and like what, what Mattapoise is gonna be facing. Um, so these things, as Bonnie described, they take a long time. We're very fortunate that we're getting to the very exciting times right now in, in our area. Um, but were it not for people like, you know, Alfred Lima and Bonnie, who are, have incredible patience and stick with these projects, they, they would not come to fruition. And, um, you know, it was just a, a few years ago, we were kind of as an organization in a little bit of a, kind of a lull, you know, while people were waiting for things to happen, we were losing, you know, membership in our group from people that just, you know, wanted to see something happen now and sooner. And I was at a mass bike event, and, and Galen's going to talk to you in a minute, uh, a couple of years ago, and I ran into Craig there. And he had done presentations for us like this in the past. And I said, you know, we're, we're struggling a little bit to kind of retain some of our membership and um, because these projects take so long. And he said, well, you guys should think out of the box from your conventional way of, of looking for transportation dollars from mass DOT and paved roadways there are other resources you should be looking at. And uh, he said, you know, the, the Mass uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation has trails uh, grants that you can, you can get. And a lot of times, um, if you go after something that's an off-road trail that's not paved, uh, you can build something for far less money with a lot of in-kind donations and volunteer efforts. And um, so this is, that's, that's great. You know, this is December time frame. So at our annual summit, which is usually in March, uh, we're looking for a speaker and um, reached back out to Craig and said, you know, we'd like to talk about the subject a little more, you got a recommendation. So he recommended Colleen Abrams from Wachusett's, Wachusett's Greenway, who's done a lot of this. She came to our summit, she spoke about all the work she had, you know, uh, maybe uh, almost as many slides as, as Craig about all the beautiful things they've done, all the volunteers, and what was really striking about her presentation was the number of people who are out working in, on these projects, doing volunteer work in the community. People want to put their hands on something and touch it and build it themselves. So we, we you know, took the cue from that. We applied for a grant from the Mass uh, DCR, and we received a, an education grant for $6,800. So it's kind of first phase. We said, we want, to, we want to get involved in the process, but we're not ready to build anything big because you have to have, you have, to have a match funding for these projects. So we, we applied for and received a $6,800 grant uh, for an education workshop series, uh, which we had a 20% match for. So over the course of 2017 and 2018, we ran a series of four workshops. We got people out into the field. We had an instructor that did a little classroom section. And then she went out and she taught people how to actually build elements of a trail. Um, it was, you know, there'd be uh, 15 to 20 people in a session uh, learning the skills that are required for this. It was very popular. People, you know, subscribed to it. We, we filled up all the workshops. And what we did is we asked people who participated to donate an, uh, an hour of their time back to our organization for every hour of classroom time. Um, here's just a few more pictures of people working together, the materials donated, and we partnered with a local land trust who needed a project built, and this was a, just a perfect union. We, we worked with them, we provided some people, they provided us a, a, a venue, a, a, a location to, to have a practical work experience, and um, people loved it, they had a great time. And then we followed up with just a couple weeks ago, um, a map and compass workshop. So we had a, a gentleman come um, and, and teach people the real basics about using a compass in, in the trails, uh, again, it was very, very uh, popular. We went out into the uh, field and, and did some practical exercises, and it was, it was a great thing. We hope to follow that with a workshop down the road that's more about GPS mapping to try and map out some trails uh, 
that have yet to be documented. Um, so one of the things we did is we started looking, uh, one of our members who's not here tonight, he's, um, his name is uh, uh, Craig also, he's uh, from, Craig Barnes from Dartmouth, and he's uh, the director of finance in, the, in that town. But he's been on our uh, committee for a few years, and he's not uh, someone who cycles. So we, we have people in our organization that are not cyclists, but they are hikers, walkers, They're, they just, they, they, excuse me, <clears throat> they like what we're doing. Uh, one of the things that, that Greg uh, brought to us that was really incredibly important was he, he in his uh, line of work, sees land acquisitions taking place in the town of Dartmouth. And Dartmouth is a large community with a lot of properties that have been sold in recent years. And he, you know, looked at these properties and, and he saw them along a, a corridor of a potential pathway for something like a, a, a cycling path. And this is, he wasn't the first one that, that uh, recognized this, and then maybe probably about eight or a little louder, sorry about that. Uh, maybe about uh, a few years before, he uh, had been involved with other people talking about this concept of this, this pathway. But what he, what he brought to our attention is that we need to design a trail to prevent these properties from being bought up that would block this pathway. And this is, this is a map. Um, this map is actually over on the side here. If you want to take a look at it later, it's a 3.7 mile stretch that goes through um, some conservation land, some properties owned by the uh, town of Dartmouth, and it looks to connect all the way from Fall River uh, through uh, Westport, Dartmouth, um, and into uh, New Bedford, and the, to connect the, uh, the blue lane that the, the mayor of New Bedford has envisioned. Um, so it's something that we're working on, but it's a very ambitious project, and there's a lot of, let me read a lot of engineering uh, and hurdles to overcome. And um, sorry, Monica, I didn't see you back there. Monica from Westport, one of our uh, members in, in the, the committee. So um, we are at the point right now where we're trying to get funding to, to do an engineering feasibility study for that project. And we've been working with communities, uh, Westport, and um, Dartmouth have already appropriated through community preservation funds, $10,000 each to going towards a study. Um, and we're, um, New Bedford is, uh, is in the process of, you know, there's an application into New Bedford for a similar amount of money. Um, and we are all looking to uh, marry that up with some funding, possibly from the South Coast Bikeway Alliance and grant funding from other resources to do uh, uh, a feasibility for that whole network to make sure we have the right path um, and that there are no you know roadblocks um, so that's a very exciting thing that we are working on right now and just in the past a little bit of um, you know we, we have applied for a grant in the past uh, for that purpose uh, with these and Fall River is also involved with that uh, Fall River by the way recently just applied for a grant for $125,000 through CPA funds to do an extension of the Kikashian River Rail Trail uh, into Westport. Um, so we're also, one of the things, um, uh, Mass DOT, Peter Sutton often comes to our sum summit, um, and he reached out to us uh, about this Mass DOT uh, Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board, and they were looking for representation from the South Coast. So um, we have now, um, on, you can see the list of uh, people are involved in that, uh, the state agency, there's quite an extensive list. And we have now um, Keith McDonald, uh, Galen's here as well, from representing Mass Bike. But Keith McDonald from our group is now a, an, on the executive uh, bicycling appointments for that committee and representing the South Coast and advocating for us in this area. It's a, it's a recent uh, appointment and we're really excited to have him doing that. A couple of the fun things we've been involved in, in the last year, last summer, uh, the town of Fairhaven and uh, Matt Poiset worked together, um, and Barney and myself, uh, and uh, a few other people to get the bike share program rolled out in our area, uh, kind of as a pilot. And we we're going to look to, um, you know, see if we could do something similar next year. The gentleman on the right, riding the bike, is actually recording our uh, video tonight for the town of Fairhaven. Um, so what we're now working on, mostly uh, Bonnie and uh, Jamie Jackout from the UMass Dartmouth, uh, is a regional request for proposals. So last year we partnered with a group called, uh, a company called Veo Ride, uh, but this year we're looking to see 
uh, if we can get competitive bids for a company that might want to do a bike share across the, the whole South Coast region. So that's an ambitious effort that uh, Bonnie and Jamie are, are taking on. Um, in past years, we've done, the, this is what Gary was referring to, um, we've, we've done a uh, bike challenge where we've encouraged people to by community sign up and, and ride and we have a number of people here tonight, John Sullivan here, Jeff in the back, uh, and Gary is actually, if you look, second place male that year, Gary <laughs> won that one, quite a few miles he put on. Um, and then the last couple of years, uh, Sandy has, has organized a team uh, from our group uh, to uh, raise funds for the South for the, uh, to the Buzzards Bay Coalition ride. So in the past couple of years, we've uh, raised uh, over $6,000 for that cause. Uh, Sandy's also was involved in a, a mini grant program. Uh, we received funding from the United Way uh, program offered by Mass Bike, where they bought bicycle lights in bulk. And then uh, we, through the United Way, Way uh, mini grant, were able to purchase uh, 75 bike lights and distribute them to people who in our area were riding their bicycles uh, to work in the dark without lights. It's a safety issue, so Bonnie actually, I mean, um, Bonnie worked on this as well, but uh, Sandy was the, was the key uh, person that would go out and try and distribute the lights to people, um, a lot of uh, them riding to work in the, uh, the fish houses and so on. Um, then this year, for the first time, we, we organized um, a pedal for the path ride. Our whole group worked very uh, closely together to do that. It was a 53-mile uh, ride uh, around our area. We had 64 riders that came together in a fairly short period of time by the time we decided we were going to do it. Um, and we, but we still managed to get about 64 riders and I think 35 or so volunteer, <coughs> excuse me, volunteers to help for the day. We raised about $2,000. So we're hoping to really make that uh, take a, a, a big step forward next year with the number of people but we also saw that as an opportunity just to engage with you know when you have 64 riders and 35 volunteers it's just that many more people that you're getting to connect with and to help uh, you advocate for what you need when you want to go you know uh, trying to advocate for funding so uh, that's what we've been doing and uh, really just uh, thank you again everyone for coming out tonight to support this <laughs> Um, so the next uh, presenter is Gail Mook. He, he's a native of Virginia. He's been in the Boston area for a while, uh, 20 years or so. 16, 17. Um, he actually bicycled from the restaurant over here tonight, so we get extra credit for that. Uh, it's a headwind. Yeah. Mass Bike is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but it's an advocacy organization that is really trying to promote bicycling for fun, fitness, and transportation, but they, they have a broad, they're, they're trying to be involved in education and advocacy and, and really a, a broad mission uh, to promote bicycling within, within the state. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Galen to fill us in more on what Mass Bike is doing. Well, thanks, Gary. Uh, thanks everybody for sticking around and coming and doing all the work that you're doing. Um, I'm actually very impressed with the momentum that the, the bikeways and all of the hard work that's going on. And I get to see what's going on across the entire state. Uh, Mass Bike is a statewide organization and I really appreciate my role when I get to go visit the communities and meet the folks who are doing the hard hard, hard, long, arduous work, um, which is what you're doing. So I want to start by thanking you for all your work and keep it up. It takes a while and you've got support and I'm impressed that we've got a great turnout. So thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Galen Munk. I'm executive director of Mass Bike. I took over the role in July, although Mass Bike has been around for 41 years. So um, there's a lot of history and ebbs and flows to the bike advocacy movement that I'm inheriting. Um, I, a little background on me, I came up to Boston to go to school and stuff around. Um, I moved to Boston uh, six years before the first bike lane was painted, so I knew what it was to be in the Wild West anarchy days. Um, it was not pretty, but we did it for necessity, for fun, for fitness, for friends, I mean all the Fs. Um, and we fought for our first bike lane and they painted it from the BU Bridge to Kenmore Square, right in the center of my school. And 
we realized there was no support, there was no enforcement, there was no education to it. So we started a, a student organization to kind of pressure the university, university pressure this uh, city, and then kind of that whole snowball effect. Um, and we kind of be part of this cultural change, this bike lane 2 or 3.0, or whatever wave we're riding right now. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be a part of it and to know that the ripple effect that we're having in Boston, I'm seeing it when I'm traveling across the state. Um, it's not just the pathways, it really is the urban areas. So I also want to echo uh, the Reverend's comments of uh, remembering New Bedford, um, the urban core, the folks who might not necessarily recreate in the paths or benefit from a house sale on the paths or be able to use it on Sunday mornings, but the folks who uh, depend on their bikes to get to work. Um, to get to school because that's their means of living. So I'd like to start my slides by starting with uh, kind of a dark photo here, I'm sorry, but uh, this is Jasmine. Uh, I think my third week on the job, I went to a open streets of Lawrence, Mass, right in the Merrimack. Um, closed down the street, we had families come out from 11 a.m. until 7 p.m. The streets were closed right in downtown Lawrence, um, and it was packed full of families. Jasmine learned how to ride a two-wheeler that day. We took the training wheels off her bike. Yes, her bike is too small. Yes, she's not wearing a helmet. Besides the point, she rode a bike for the first time. And I got to be a part of that movement, that moment, that, that joy that she got when she realized that she could do it. And to be a, that, that spark, to see that spark in Jasmine reminds me this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and so I'd like to start my slides, even though we're talking about policies and agencies and, and grant programs, et cetera, we're doing it for folks like Jasmine. So I kind of want to keep that in perspective. Um, what is Mass Bike? How many are Mass Bike members in the house? Great. Um, how many have no idea what Mass Bike is? Excellent. Um, I'm not surprised. I've heard that. Uh, even though we've been around for 41 years, um, being a statewide advocacy organization is tough. There's a lot of local issues that really matter, and that's where the real meat of the issues come in. So keep doing what you're doing locally, but know that I am here with Mass Bike to think about the broader pictures, the policy changes, the statewide conversations that are sometimes you know, generations in the making, uh, but it's, it's a lot of higher level conversations. I wish I could go down to just fighting for this crosswalk or fighting for this one parcel because um, I know that's where the, the impact is really felt. But um, we do a lot of statewide stuff. There's a lot on this slide. You don't need to know it. But I do want you to remember that we are a member organization. So I encourage you to become members of Mass Bike. Um, become members of all the organizations that are presenting today because we're all doing um, great work in our own little niches and we all need the support. Um, but what is our vision? Our vision that I've been kind of been crafting over the past six months for what a statewide organization can do for bicycling. Um, the first is education. I'm noticing that there's a complete lack of education of safe and legal riding for cyclists, how to be a motorist, how to be a truck driver around a cyclist, um, how to implement RMV trainings, how to get bike and pedestrian training, by the way, in the public school systems. Make it so that we're really getting into the mindset of the cultural change. So my background for the past 10 years has been doing bike workshops. I'm a League of American Bicyclists um, and a certified instructor. I love teaching. And so that's kind of what I'm bringing to Mass Bike, first off. Uh, we're fighting for legislation. Um, we are just about to enter the new legislative bill filing session. We have a slate of bills that we're working on, some are with Craig regarding those numbers that he threw up earlier, some of it's with the alphabet soup of dealing with DOT and DCR. Um, we're fighting for sensible e-bike legislation. And whether or not you like e-bikes or don't like e-bikes, there's no way to regulate them. So one thing we're really working on is to clarify what an electric bicycle is so that a municipality can have the power to regulate, to allow or disallow, depending on where you want it or don't want it. But right now it's such a gray area that it's going to take an act of legislation in order to clear that up. Um, <clears throat> we are a chapter-based organization, which means that even though my headquarters is in Boston, we have chapters in Pioneer Valley, we have chapters in the North Shore, we have chapters in Central Mass with Blackstone and Worcester, 
We're um, tomorrow heading to Hyannis to talk about reigniting the Cape Cod chapter of Mass Bike. Uh, potentially, this Buzzards Bay area could be broke into a Cape Cod chapter if that gets started, or maybe there's a South Coast chapter for Mass Bike. But what I envision is that I can't do all the work and my staff can't do all the work. We're dependent on a chapter model because you know your issues best, you know your communities best, you can do the real networking, bridge building, literally. Um, and so I'm, I'm here to kind of uh, provide the higher level tools to the chapters. So that's the chapters. Um, <clears throat> one big thing we're trying to do also is connect all the friends of groups. So along with chapters, even on the more local level, like um, the, the Seacoast Bikeway is a great example of connecting all the different disparate friends of groups into one linear corridor. Because now we're realizing that these paths are going to connect. So what happens when the Minuteman connects over to the Bruce Friedman, connects over to the Mass Central, connects over to all the rest of them all the way down, which Bruce will talk about the East Coast Greenway. Um, we have an organization that represents Maine to Florida, but what is the organization that's going to do the more regional approach of connecting the, the communities? And there are 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, which means that there are 351 different strategies and arguments to be made. So, um, this is something that I'm, 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 I'm working on. Um, and then rides, events, et cetera, the butts on bikes, the, the ice cream rides, that's awesome. I'm gonna kind of want to put this up front, actually, for Bonnie, because you should all see those photos. Um, all the smiles on those faces, just to get back to why we do what we do. Um, and also, I'm here to listen, so I'm also getting a lot out of these presentations, and I'll stick around for questions. I'll try to fly through the rest of this. I uh, talked about our chapters. We started the Central Mass chapter last year. Um, also in the first month of my role, we grew a chapter. So now it's a whole other beast to tame. Um, I like the herding cats because those cats do some good work. Um, but we're looking at what's going to happen around this neck of the woods because there's a lot of action and energy. So expect me to be um, calling and knocking on the doors and having some more meetings about how we can impact you. Uh, education, just to go into a little bit more, there's a lot to it. This goes on and on and on. Um, it's hard to really tell what's kind of the, the photos in here, but we're doing um, like basically on bike trainings. So one thing that I'd like to put Bonnie on as well, we're talking a little bit about this, is all these dockless bike share companies are launching in your neck of the woods, but there's no formalized education to teach people the safe and legal ways to ride. Folks are gonna hop on a bike, they haven't been on a bike in 20 years, maybe they've never been on a bike. They never went through any sort of formal education know how to safely run. So just as one example, using the dockless as my hook to get into a community to do some education, to do some proper bike education. <clears throat> um, and legislation and policies, kind of went into this, this a minute ago, but um, there's a lot going on on the state level, which you may or may not know, is impacting your streets. Uh, we have policies that are going into place. We have a DOT, which is actually very responsive right now. They're funding things, they're listening to things, they're putting positions in their institutions, in their departments that are, that are required to listen to people like me. Which, I, it's, that's, a, that's a game changer. This is a, a complete, complete reversal of D, the, the DOT that I used to work with when we first started. So um, I'm encouraged with the momentum. And it actually is kind of working its way, it's trickling up. All the grassroots movements is really, the, it's, it's really making its way to the top. And to Greg's point about the governor shows up to ribbon cuttings, um, and that's, that's, that's because we are there. It's not because he wants us to be there. It really is a bottom-up movement. Um, I could go on about this, but I won't. Um, I'm also here to listen up to your priorities. I don't want to say that I know what's going on. And as I've been traveling around from North Adams to Nantucket, um, it's it's independent communities with their own independent needs. And so I am learning the ropes now. Again, I have been at it six months, um, but I'm coming out with passion and with a, a willingness to listen. So that's my pitch of working with me and my organization in what you do. I love this graphic too. It's kind of hard to see, but that is from the RMV. This is a uh, list of cyclic fatalities year over year. And if you look, in 2015, we had 12 in the state. And these are public roads, so not everything's captured. Um, two years ago, we had 10. Last year, we had 10 fatalities. In 2018, we had three. 
So we're down 70% in one year. We're down 75% in three years. So it's working. What we are doing is working. Ridership is up. Severe crashes are down. The rates of crashes are going down. It's, it's working. It's going to take time. We're really going to get there. But it, it's, it's real. And I saw a bike box in New Bedford today. The bike box is like the front of the intersection. They kind of paint green so a cyclist can safely turn left. It's amazing. We got our first one in Boston like three years ago. Now I can see it down here. It's happening. Be inspired. And again, do it for Jasmine because she's going to be using that bike box. Right? Um, actually, I want to go back to one thing that's on the slide too. Uh, getting back to the interagency coordination. Um, this is also a big re uh, revelation that's happening at the state level. It's not just the DOT that we're dealing with or just the DCR that we're dealing with. All of these agencies are all communicating. Uh, I'm on the Massachusetts Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Board. It's got 11 different seats on it. I think seven of which are different agencies within the uh, underneath the governor, including tourism. So they're taking this seriously so that these agencies are no longer silent, which is great. Um, where am I going from here? Okay, I'm going to dive into this for just one second. Interagency coordination is important for the trails. Mass trails, is anybody unfamiliar with the new mass trails reorganization within the state? Raise your hand, it's fine. I can go into it for a second. Excellent, good. It's about a third of you in the room. So what's going on is the Energy and Affairs, no, the, the what is it, the Executive Office of Environmental Energy Affairs uh, sits down with the Department of Conservation and Recreation, sits down with the Department of Transportation every other week to talk about, just about, trails. That's it. Which means that if a project request comes in for a bridge that goes over wetlands, and the DCR says, oh, we can't mess with that because the EOA is going to be, that we, permits are going to be impossible. No, but then Kurt comes in and says, oh, we can, we can handle that, no worries. Uh, and they say, oh, well, where are we going to get the funding from because this bridge is actually going to be $8 million as opposed to 1.5. DOT says, oh, well, we've got some slippage money from the District 4 because that project didn't get paid, so we ended up having all those extra millions. They can have that conversation. That is a game changer and should be on your radar for what you will be doing locally here. Because this Mass Trails Interagency Coordination Actually, I'll leave this slide up for a second. It's hard to see, but there's a website to go to. It's mass.gov slash mass trails. The bottom button, it's hard to see, but it says apply for a mass trails grant. That is a very important button for you to know about because the deadline for that grant application is February 1st. This is the first year that they're doing it. This is somewhat under what the DCR used to do for their recreational trails program. But it doesn't have to be just a rec trails anymore. It could be anything. It doesn't even have to be a DOT standard pathway anymore, which requires a certain amount of width and a certain amount of accessibility. They have flexibility under this grant program to pick and choose what your issue is and apply it to whatever they can find that would fit the bill. So this is a very important thing that you all should know as advocates exists now on the web. Now, granted, the timeline's very fast, pull the grant together, you have to have a town buy-in, you have to have a match, you have to have up to a 25% design. There's a lot to it. So this might be a next year thing for you, or the year after, or the year after. But this is now real, now that we've got a re-elected governor. I don't see this going away anytime soon. Also on this website, which is also pretty cool, is an interactive map put out by MAPC, which interfaces with the walking and biking trails and even the on-street stuff. So this is an example of um, bikes and multi-use pathways in the eastern Massachusetts region. You see where a lot of the importance is really placed. Obviously, it's in the hub of Boston. That's where a lot of the battles have been fought and won. But you can see little spurs. You can see a bit of the Massachusetts Rail Trail coming in. You can see the Bruce Freeman in there. Um, you can see little connections where, to look at Craig's map earlier, the dead railroads. This overlay is very well with that. Because that's where the winds have happened. That's where the, the not really called low hanging fruit, because kind of it's prickly and some of it's not ripe yet, but it's, it's fruit. Um, and then I took a similar screenshot of down here just to get a sense of, you know, what, what you're dealing with. And this is current. This is not planned. This is not an ocean. This is what you've got. 
but a good tool to use to understand what Massachusetts has going for it right now. And this is, again, is under the Mass Trails uh, program. Um, and you're probably all familiar with this. One more thing to put on your radar, statewide issue, is the statewide bicycle plan. This bike plan is in draft form. It's about 56 pages or so. It's an implementation list of what the state intends to do for the next four years, eight years, maybe 10 years, how often they re-update a plan. But this is what their priorities are. This is what they're going to look at. I encourage you to look this up. Mass Bike has this on our website. If you are a member, we're going to blast you over the next three weeks to get your comments in. It's a draft. Comments are due at the end of the month. Um, it's basically what are the priorities, what are the states going to be looking at. And there are measures that uh, it's identified that it will track to see it, it, the efficacy of this plan. But if you want your opinions heard, now is the open period for getting those opinions heard. I can talk more about this in questions, but I want to put this on your radar too. So the two big things, the Mass Trails program and the bike plan that you should really be paying attention to as a statewide issue. <clears throat> so what can you do? This is my second last slide. Don't worry, I'm almost done. Um, join Mass Bike and all the rest of the organizations because everybody's doing different niches, different facets of this gem are being represented. Um, join things, this is an example of the Lights Brigade that um, Sandy and Bonnie are helping out with, uh, handing out the lights to folks who need them. We are generally always fundraising to get lights. This is an example of some of the stuff that we do. Um, get to know your local, your local elected officials, get to know your planning agencies, get to know uh, basically anybody and everybody who will be concerned with what you're talking about. And just keep it going, just keep beating that drum. It takes decades, no question about it. Yeah. Um, and lastly, just keep in touch. Uh, Mass has got a, a, a kind of a revamped website we're working on, but um, feel free to shoot me an email at any point in time. Happy to get back to you. Happy to come and visit. Happy to come take a bike ride and experience what you're experiencing out here. And know that, you know, we're, we're kind of a, a scrappy and small staff right now, but we are paying attention to the bigger picture. And we have a, a, a seat at the table, and hopefully our voice is loud enough that we're going to get heard. Thank you. So our final present, presentation this evening is from Bruce Donald. We are, we are going from the, I don't want to say micro, but from the regional expanding outwards. So now we're going to talk about something that goes all the way from the Florida Keys to the border of Maine. Um, and we're a part of it. That's the most amazing thing. We're actually a spur on the, on the East Coast Greenway uh, plan. So, I'll turn it over to uh, Bruce, who's actually responsible for only three of the states involved in this, uh, in this plan. But. Uh, I took off my lingo title, which was Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, so I, I, I've been doing this for about 20 years, and I have the luxury of being paid to build my trails, which is kind of a stunning achievement for me, because I was uh, for about 17 years, not paid to build bike trails. Uh, I, was, I was doing what you guys were doing. Uh, I ran the Front Valley Trails Council in Central Connecticut, a uh, 700 member, 501c3, and uh, we got a lot of good things done. Uh, one of which, just one of which, is we have a doctor trail program in 15 towns that has 81 people involved in cleaning up the trail on a weekly basis. That trail is the Front Canal Heritage Trail, which goes from the Haven all the way up to Northampton, Mass. One of the reasons why uh, I spent a lot of time in the Great Pennsylvania. So, for the last 20 years, I've essentially been watching uh, Massachusetts because I've been working in Connecticut. So now what I do is I am the Tri-State Coordinator for the East Coast Greenway Alliance, and I am uh, New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. So I'm here on behalf of our New England sport there, who's based up in Portland, Maine. She couldn't make it tonight, and I was pleased to do so. Uh, another thing you should know uh, about me is uh, my mantra. Does that come up? Yes, it's if you just push the down button, uh -huh. it will. Okay. 
it will come, but it's not running properly. Mm -hmm. Well, I can leave on that. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah, just um, push it down, up and down. Okay, so so my mantra is I want to provide uh, value to a community. So when I swoop in, uh, you know, like a, a, a chubby vulture, um, what, what I'm doing really is providing value in some form or another. And uh, I take that very seriously. Um, I am the legislatively appointed chairman of the Connecticut Greenways Council. I sit on 12 boards in four states. And, uh, and I, t I take it seriously. I, I don't have much of a home life, but that's fine. <laughs> so, uh, whoop. how did you get there? That's fine. Oh, no, wait a second. Yeah, it's not really doing it. <coughs> so that's the first slide. Right, it's not, for some reason, it's not acting normal. Here, let me see if yeah, I can fix that. I'll, I'll see you talk. Um, so, uh, 3,000, these goes to be 3,000 miles. Um, we've been doing this for 26 years. 15 states and the District of Columbia. 450 communities it goes through. It has been called, and I think it's correct, the uh, 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 the urban equivalent. There you go. Ah, there you go. Okay. Um, I don't. I work off this because I want to make this fairly short. So we have questions. Uh, we have a staff of 13 out of uh, Durham, North Carolina, primarily. Uh, I'm a satellite office in Central Connecticut. We have somebody in Maine, as I mentioned. We have somebody in Philly. Uh, uh, two people in Durham. Uh, somebody in Georgia and somebody in Florida. They're essentially doing, doing what I'm doing, right? So they're the Greenways coordinators. Uh, we want to foster active, healthy lifestyles, and the route is now more than 32% off-road as of the end of last year, so it's a third done, which when you think about it is kind of amazing. Okay, here we go. So why, why do you do it? We've talked about this. By the way, just so you're aware, when I knew I was going to be last, I decided to, to do summation stuff so, so, so we can make sure that we get good questions out of our audience, right? So uh, obviously, it's become an integral part of transportation policy at most of the DOTs that I work with. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, no, no, not so much. It's, it's really changed dramatically. Provide active transportation opportunities. The old mantra in the original Rails to Trails, of course, was the, was these were recreational facilities, right? They were linear parks. We now know there's so much more than that. Health, pollution and noise abatement, obviously fantastic community amenities, and they foster tourism and economic development. None of this, none of this stuff you don't know, but again, I, I, for the purposes of working on this. So, how do we do this? We do this with friends. This is a, a, a group of REI staff uh, in the mid-Atlantic states, but just gives you an idea of the type of people we work with uh, in our communities. We don't, we don't, I don't build bike trails. I, I say I build bike trails. I help to build bike trails. The people who build bike trails are you guys. That's, that's, that's who's building these trails. Okay. I wanted to put this slide in because it seems simplistic, but it, it really isn't. There's three components that I, I believe have to be in place in order to have a facility finally get built. And don't forget, the timelines here are crazy long. We all know this. Probably the easiest trail that you'll ever build in your life might take seven years, eight years, <coughs> nine years. Um, I have pieces of trail that, that people have been working on that are long dead. I mean, I'm talking like 35 years. Uh, so. Community support, it has to be there. That's number one. Number two, strong local advocacy. You think they're the same thing, they're not the same thing. You have to have somebody running something. And they have to be out there, cheerleading, they have to be going to town meetings. They have to be waging placard, right? You guys know this. But you also have to have the third part, which is the town itself. The pros have to buy in. So that includes the elected officials, but it also includes the people that do the work the engineer, the planner, the rest of the staff. That's the three-legged stool. And if you don't have this, it's not going to be, it's just not, it's going to be 
You might get it tight, but it'll take even longer. So, this draws attention. Look, it draws attention in red. It allows for attracting design money. Attracting design money, as you know, is probably the single worst thing that you're going to have to do. Uh, but once you do it, you have a project. Then you have something that's packaged. You can go to Mass DOT, you can go to DCR, you can go to the MPOs. Uh, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, ways to fund these things now. Okay, so here's, here's Massachusetts, 138 spine room miles. It's way more than that if you take the continental route, which is, of course, you know, the south route through the Cod, very lost. You're drawing together separate brands. And I bring this up because this branding idea is important. You've got a trail. You've got a trail. There's other trails here. I see people with other trails. They're all interconnected. And if there's a recognition that they're interconnected in some form or another, finding money to, to build them is easier. Getting recognition on a statewide level is easier. And people like you can go to legislators and say, boom, look at this. this Look what this connects. So this issue of connectivity on a, in a broad sense is hugely important when we're building these trails. So another thing, um, and I talk about fundraising, membership, and partnerships. We've already talked about this. Again, I'm, I'm thinking about our questions that are coming up. But you see the East Coast Greenway sign there. So the, the East Coast Greenway sign uh, in its present form is aluminum. It's about five and a quarter inches wide, about 15 inches tall. We came up with this solution because uh, it's, you can see it from the bike, but you can also see it from the car, which was important. Okay, so what do I do? We recognize, nurture, and partner with groups building the trail in their communities. I talk about our science. It's, uh, it, it's not really the physical sign. It's, it's the idea that you're part of something bigger, right? And again, this, this concept that we, that I, never upstage uh, my partners, right? We're, we're in the background. We're, we're, I'm here to help you, right? That's, that's, that's my job. And we've got to make deals with people. And making deals with people, it's not as easy as it sounds. It's actually, sometimes it's absolutely, you just want to tear your hair out and have a chair left. <laughs> so, uh, I want to keep that mercifully short. Uh, I think we're all available for questions, right? So, right. Yeah. excellent. And please, by the way, don't hesitate. The, the reason why this is up here uh, is so that you will call me, right? Uh, if you have a question, don't hesitate. Deputy Counsel and Research Analyst for uh, the Mass House Transportation Committee. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the fact that Bill Strauss, our legislator, um, is the chairman of the committee. So I don't know if you wanted to say anything, but we want to thank you for all your work and we want to thank Bill for all the work and support that we get on bike issues at the Mass uh, in the House. So. With that, we'll turn it over for questions, and if you want to ask a question, I'll give the microphone to whoever you are asking. Yeah, well, I, I just, just a quick one. I wanted to ask you how one goes about um, donating or contributing to the... Uh, um, thank you. Um, the Manapoisset, um, the Friends of the Manapoisset Bike Path have a GoFundMe page. It's uh, GoFundMe. Mattapoise at Rail Trail. Um, and there's a whole story about what we're doing on the GoFundMe page. Um, you can also go to our website um, and you'll find our address and you can write checks there. But additionally, I did bring, I think, 10 copies of my initial draft appeal. So if somebody wants to take one with them, um, I can, 
uh, give you my hand out. Thank you. I think this uh, question is primarily to you, Craig, or possibly uh, people who are local as well. And that is, uh, I came from uh, Bethesda, Maryland. So you came here tonight? No. <laughs> no. I came here over the last year. Or the past year. So I haven't been here very long, and I'm still getting to know everything. But the, uh, uh, in Bethesda, D.C. area, you probably know, there's a fabulous place on the trails there. Um, but very recently, there's been uh, in, in part of a um, proposal to extend a, a bike trail um, out of Bethesda to Silver Spring. And the problem is that there is going to be a trolley line. They want to take the abandoned rail line, and they're going to convert it to a trolley line to connect the outer suburbs, so basically, with, with D.C. So now there's tension between the uh, use of, the, of these dead rail lines for new forms of transportation that aren't bicycles. So there are over 200 rail with trail projects in the United States right now. That is to say dual use corridors. Yes, I, yeah, so that's what I, I, I picked that up from one of your slides. Yeah. But in the I had a bunch of slides there, it did not yeah. turn on for that. Yeah, but in the DC area there's a lot of tension around this. There shouldn't be. And there's, but, there's a lot of companies and firms down there that are expert on rail with trail. Uh -huh. This can work. There's, there's high frequency 70 mile an hour rail with trails with, with uh, commuter rail frequency on them. Mm -hmm. You can do that. And yeah, you it seems that. like you should be able to do it, but I know again, for people here who know more about this area, um, I guess there's a proposal, it's been a, a proposal for a long time, to extend rail from New Bedford uh, to Boston. Is there any, I know everybody says the same thing, they all land, but is there any, any, any sort of putting a, a you know, a, a, a trail along that? Uh, I can actually uh, speak to that a little bit. Um, so I've been involved in a few situations of, of rail with trail. Um, the buffer is usually some sort of defense. Uh, it depends on how wide the corridor is. Uh, but uh, more recently, uh, we've been playing let's make a deal with the railroad corridors. I'm working on a huge long corridor in New Jersey right now called Boom Line, which goes essentially from uh, right across from Manhattan all the way over to uh, Newark. And that's going to be a combination of rail making, and I'll describe that in a minute, uh, and an actual leaseback policy where if they ever decide to build light rail on it, they could give the uh, owner operator of the bike trail uh, a two to three year warning and take it back uh, on eminent domain. So 99 year lease. So there's, way, there's ways to get around this. Uh, they're actually effective. So that's, those, are, those are some. I was on the committee that wrote the first rail with trail report back in the late 90s. And it was a very newfangled idea. And I was there because I was a member of the railroad industry. But you will see more and more rail with trail projects as you get deeper into the yeah. whole century. Because there's, piece, there's pieces that are harder to build, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and a, lot, a lot of railroads have suddenly realized that they're, they're almost more real estate companies than anything else now. And, and so they, they realize the value of the corridors, and in many cases, they don't want to sell. Mm -hmm. so, so a lot of these deals are going to become a lot more, uh, especially in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. Where so much, so much of the rail corridor was just abandoned, uh, the, even the abandonment process now uh, has gotten just brutally ridiculous at the federal level. So you have to jump through, you know, the surface transportation. Uh, I mean, I don't have to go into it, but it's it's a, it's a big pile of worms. Thanks so much. It's so interesting. Um, so great detail, um, Bruce. I wanted to ask you about the East Coast Greenway. There seem to be two corridors, and um, one is more complete than the other. Can you talk a little bit about the progress of both of those? Sure. So, there's... Yeah, there's uh, it's yeah, uh, 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 yeah. Um, so, in answer to your question, there's, there's the spine corridor, which is the primary corridor. It is the corridor that we have 
written down internally as where we believe the trail will go. Now, does it, 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 it right, so, so in Massachusetts, that would be the northern piece that you saw, right? As opposed to the southern piece, which is a complementary piece. So the complementary group was always designed to take, for instance, in part, the Cape Cod Rail Trail, right? It's just, it's just so cool that you, you couldn't pass it up. Uh, and there are other parts in a variety of different states that have similar issues. Um, I think of Maine, which has two routes. Uh, South Carolina has two routes, uh, in, 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 and so does North Carolina in, in a number of spots. So if you go on um, our website, on the mapping function, you can see this in, in detail. But what I want to make sure that everyone here understands is that uh, you know, we are opportunistic. If, 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 a, if a state is building a huge new piece of trail that looks like it's going to pass, then I and my superiors will look at it and say, huh, hmm, how does this work? And we've actually done that in a few instances. As it gets more built out, as a practical matter, we're now really more looking at linkages and, and connected pieces. But early on, 20 years ago, we were, we were all over it. There, there's, there's pieces of East Coast Greenway that, that don't intersect with it, that eventually we're going to have to decertify as East Coast Greenway. So that's your answer. How much is the Massachusetts going to be created at this point? A little over 50 percent. Yeah, about that. And that's pretty standard for New England. Um, states that are hard to build trail in, Georgia is 3 percent done. Just so you're aware. Uh, New Jersey is about 60 percent. Uh, New York is a little over 50. Connecticut is 48 percent. So the, the Northeast, which had, by the way, a, a much bigger jump start than the rest of the country, uh, you see that. And that's part and parcel of what we're talking about is the Northeast really was the, the, the crucible that started building these trails and parts of parts of uh, places out west. I should say if you use, I was on the East Coast Greenway Alliance website today, you use their mapping function, you can take your location and it will tell you the exact distance to the to the closest place that you can reach the, the, the Greenway. So from my house, it's 1.06 miles to the junction of River Road and Akushnet Road, which is the closest place I can link up to it. Two rooms. 
<laughs> you can't quit your day job for a two-room bed and breakfast. <laughs> but I, um, I'll do several real estate transactions a year for people who love our beautiful valley so much they want to move there. But the best, the best uh, bike path, rail trail, in North America for tourism is not in the United States. It is outside of Montreal on Petit Train de Newark, Little Train of the North. And there you call a provincial tourism agency. And you have, they'll ask you basic questions like, how far do you like to bike each day? Do you want to be shuttled to the far end, which is 200 kilometers away? And do you want to be, uh, have your luggage shuttled each morning after breakfast to the next place? Do you want to, uh, what kind of place do you want to stay in? Do you want to stay in a tenting campground or a palatial estate? So we chose all the options, including uh, mid-range bed and breakfast like ours, and you get transported to the far end, and over four days you bike back to your car. And uh, they don't speak much English there, but they do understand Visa and debit. <laughs> and they have UPS service there, so you can buy things along the way and just have a ship to your house. Yeah. Very, very great. Yeah, I was going to say, they understand a the full claim. <laughs> It's uh, part of this is Route Vert, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's part of that. Yeah. It is all totally off-road. It was the it was the snow train to the Laurentian Mountains, and uh, where the Winter Olympics was held outside of Montreal a generation ago. That's on the path. So it's very interesting. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. I think this was let's give our presenters. <laughs> Better informed, and we will announce if, if the men's uh, fellowship comes up with any ideas for other uh, items. We'll see it in the newspaper or somewhere, and we'll get the word out. So we're delighted you could come on tonight. Thanks again.